my sincere gratitude for joining this uh, a troubled time now we all are facing throughout the world. Is I think is one of the seismic event what is happening in uh, the Eastern Europe and that actually uh, causing the lot of, uh, you know, that uh, agony, a lot of problems and pain to all of us, both in mind, body and soul. And I hope that this special symposium will help us to hit some of those pains through meditation, spirit, spirituality and discussions and interactions so virtually. So uh, again, welcome to you all, 27th of February, and just it is um, the end of this month very soon. Um, now, uh, I'm so pleased uh, looking at, you know, the seeing many of you have joined today uh, in this discourse uh, on uh, health, and uh, the topic today will be discussed is the law of karma plant. What an interesting topic. There are many rules of terms of karma, and I am sure that, that if we just follow some of those rules of karma, we may have the better chance to, uh, you know, that uh, stay more calm, more quiet, and we'll have the great wisdom, what is happening now. It, it seems to me that many of us lost our great wisdom and that is provoking the situations what we all are facing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of the, you know, the interesting people, most interesting people with great wisdom uh, who are contributing to the society. I think I was just meeting one of the minds, great minds from Canada who joined just five o'clock, even uh, before me, uh, it seems is, um, uh, 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 is one of the, uh, I'm just uh, looking at the name, uh, uh, who joined this, who Amal joined from Amal, Amal Tagore, thank Amal Tagore. you so much, thank you so much for joining, and Shantosh uh, 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 Shorka already mentioned uh, the many other people, I just happen to believe that there is another curriculum in India, <laughs> so well done, actually curriculum from Bangladesh, uh, uh, Mr. Udar Shankar joined, uh, who is the general secretary of uh, Lankrishna Mission, uh, recently uh, established that uh, the big mission over there. And also, you know, that I would like to just mention one name, uh, Mr. John Chol, a very young fellow from Neil family, uh, who has been working uh, with his uh, other fellows and uh, providing two Gita school. And I have seen hundreds of young children. Um, the John Chol, if you are there, if you are listening to me, providing uh, education to 100 children. And recently he talked with the prime minister with his other fellows and also uh, rescued number of young Hindu girls uh, you know, that, uh, from being converted by others. So my special thanks to this young boy from Neil family who just first time joined this. Now, first of all, may I request to this humble audience very interesting audience, very uh, that knowledgeable audience to mute your system if you don't need to speak. The whole program is being recorded and uh, some screenshot will be taken and uh, all these will be shared later stays. And uh, of course, the main facilitator today is Dr. Uh, Shukanto Shah who joined from Australia. Now, what I can say about uh, Dr. Shukanto Shah is a great mind. He is currently having a joint appointment uh, with the University of Queensland, Australia, as a and also senior research fellow and Queensland Health um, Authority, senior scientist. He has been with Queensland Health since 2000. It's for the last 21 years. He has been providing his service. He has a master's degree in life science from University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Also after migrating to Australia early 19 or mid 90s, he completed his master's degree in nutritional epidemiology uh, and later a PhD psychiatric epidemiology uh, from the School of Medicine, um, University of Queensland. He was awarded fellowship from USA, Oshita Fellowship, is one of the most prestigious uh, fellowship in the world, I must say. And also Australia, uh, Colombo Plant Scholarship and several other grants, Shukanto, Dr. Shukanto has previous work experience, including senior lecturer, analyst with Harvard University USA and collaborating yes, yes. work with many other international universities. He published 72 scientific peer reviewed article in high impact journals with, I'm just perplexed. I'm really astonished by looking at his scholarly citations in the world, 54,456 citations. 
Thank you, Dr. Shukant Prada, why you are contributing to the scientific community and academia. This is unbelievable. He's a reviewer of about 10 scientific journals. His research interest is in the long generic, non-generic risk factor epidemiology of schizophrenia. And this is the word I'm always using nowadays, what is happening now in the middle of Europe and other psychiat psychotic disorders having a kind of project that access global burden of disease profit. Also, Dr. Shukampa, his great understanding, great knowledge and contributions, research contribution towards uh, Indian philosophy, Hinduism, and Bhagavad Gita. Let's not going so further. I would like to invite Dr. Shukanta to say, but before that, I'd like to say something as uh, the outset of this uh, symposium is someone raised. We all are praying for the betterment of the society. What is happening in Ukraine is not acceptable by any civil society member without saying who did it, who is responsible, lets the great wisdom prevail all these bad things. The karma, the rules must come back. We all must learn something, the great rules of karma. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Shukanto, uh, please. And after this, uh, his discussion, we'll have a fantastic stimulating, stimulating engagement from the uh, audience. Uh, we'll have a long engagement question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Shukanto, this is now yours. Please, Florian, Thank you. if you can start. Thank you. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevayo. Firstly, I thank BZRF for giving me the opportunity to present the one of the most important, most discussed yoga of Sanatan Dharma, Karma Yoga. Today is very auspicious day because this is Akadoshi, a uh, I'm all, I'm there. I, I'm already on my video is on. Yes, yes, you can see him. Yes, he's there. So the camera selection tick as a bar two thousand of two from one as an one thing to muscular. I can second option as a no, that's okay. He's there. We can see. Uh, it all depends on the, the view. You can see. Okay. Yes. Okay. My humble obeisance to all of you. Let us start. Uh, just one minute. Just one minute, Doctor Shukanto. Yes, I'm please. going to. I'm going to mute everyone now, and I'll not yes. allow anyone uh, should be unmuted. So after muting, please, if you can unmute your system. Let me mute all. So thank you. Okay, today. Uh, now you can unmute your system, please, Dr. Shukanto. Uh, you can unmute your system. Yes, now. yes, I, yes, I did. Okay, today's presentation is about a karma jigyasa quest for law of karma. Usually karma has many aspects, many components. I will only touch two particular components today. So one of the question I'll answer is that karma is all planned by the Lord. So before I uh, go on presentation, that one of the Guru Pranam, because I'm initiated, the Guru Pranam is Agnano Timirandhasya Gananjaya Salakaya Chakurun Militan Jana Tasmai Se Grave Nama Namaha. Okay, today's objective is only two questions, two aspects. One is the basic law of karma how we generate karma and then a little bit complicated things are dimensions of karma that all the dimensions of karma i it is actually based on our scriptures what we want it is to understand how karma generates that determines next life and beyond that is transmigration 
See, if we do not understand the inner mechanism of karma, that is the various dimensions and how we generate karma, then we may not understand why and how transmigration happens, how karma is transferred from one gener one life to another. And one of the questions within this uh, uh, time, I'll answer, as I told you before, that whether karma is planned by the God. Let's see what our Vedic leaders are say about law of karma. Now, one of the thing I would like to touch here that with my limited knowledge, what I found that whatever the uh, issues are written in Vedas, that is actually philosophically explained in Upanishad, and that is also a giving a gist in Bhagavad Gita. And I found a nicely consistent and coherent uh, text in all these three scriptures. That is our main scriptures. So let us today, I will only mention the from the citations from the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita. So law of karma. First, Rishi Yagavalka. Uh, introduce the law of karma with a only one simple sentence. He said, as it does, so it becomes. What did it mean? The concept is a philosophy that life is governed by a system of cause and effect, actions and reactions. What it means that karma is not only simply some action, it is a actions and reactions, and some reactions as consequences, long-term or short-term. It accumulates in our cosmic account, and then that determines our next life forms and beyond. Why I say beyond? Because there is a, we can break the cycle of birth and death and achieve the moksha. So karma is a spiritual law. So the law of karma, we know this, but still I say that, that there are two fundamental principles of Sanadana Dharma. One is law, karma, and the transmigration. That already I just said. And Atma carries karma to the next life and beyond. So definitely the transmigration is the inevitable outcome of karma. So Bhagavad Gita, in chapter four, Jnana Yaga say, the karma is complex. And we need to understand types of karma, even learned people are confused. Let's see what is Gita saying. <laughs> Actually, these two shlokas saying what I say just in the text is written there. So we need to learn types of karma. There is a B karma and O karma. That is the two term has been used in that sloka. So I will give a little bit detail later, but just to mention here that B karma is with consequences or reactions. That is not a good karma. A karma is when there is no consequences. It means that is a mode of goodness. Uh so how karma generates? Usually 25 to 30 factors come together to generate karma. Initially, karma generates, I'm just giving a very quick one line that what I am going to elaborate later. Initially, karma generates by the influence of prakriti and empowered by purusha. I'll discuss what is Prakriti and Purusha later. 
and then karma is produced by the gross body, driven by the desires. When I say driven, it is, means that it's a compulsion from our mind because mind has desires, feelings, so that we need to satisfy our senses. So we need to know prakriti, purusha, gross body in detail, and the subtle body. Now, what they are, that is I'm going to detail. Our human has three existences, gross body, subtle body, and causal body. Gross body, as, as it is saying in the next slide, I'll come back there. And subtle body is our manas. Man, we are manusha. Take manas means mind, and causal body is the soul. But in Tattariya Upanishad, it is very clearly described that these three existences actually there are five cells: Panchakosha, Annamaikosha, Pranamaikosha, Manamaikosha, Bhiganamaikosha, and Anandamaikosha. First two is Annamai and Pranamai. Our pran, our life is based on food. It's either human, animal, or even tree, even plants. So next are manas, one. Manas has two parts. One part is, has desires and feelings and compulsion. Another part is called bhikkhanamayakosha, that is a filtering system. Whether should I do the work or not? So this type of consciousness works there. And finally, is go to Ananda Maikasha, which is our causal body, the soul, Aratma, where it accumulates and transfer. So just a quickly nutshell that our gross bodies look like that. Many people describe that our Atma is in the heart or somewhere. Actually, it is not. That's why I say is not. It is actually, remember that our uh, Bhagavad Gita Shloka 2, chapter 2, 17 Shloka saying that the whole body is pervades with the eternal soul. So that's why the soul is actually pervades the whole body, is not situated either in brain or anywhere. Then we have manas. So after death, our gross body vanished, but what is transferred is actually the Atma carrying the karma with our subtle body, that is our mind. That two things transfer. So now we need to know a little bit more detail about gross body. You know, all of you know that gross body has five constituents, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Kiti of touch, morudbom. That is the panchabhuta which constitute our body. Now there is a, another thing who is usually not much discussed, not much taught, but it is a very nice explanation of our energy flow of our total system. That's called panchabayu. It means the material air. I, it is another very uh, big uh, discussion, but I'll just touch only that is that panchabayu is udana, prana, samana, bhayana, and apana. Why it is important is in Mundaka Upanishad say, when the soul is purified from the five kinds of material air pollution, the true spirit is revealed. It means that karma usually works and that it contaminates the soul and using panchabayu. Let's move on. Gross body. We, everybody know that we have five senses. In fact, we have six, including mine. But we have five, five senses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin. That is called ganandriya. It means our, uh, based on our knowledge and our uh, physical system. And then we have kandandriya. Then we have subtle five elements. Actually, this three uh, components of gross body is actually indriya means senses. It is all interrelated. One is like a verb, noun, verb, and adjective. 
this type of thing is worked together. So these are our gross body. And now this is the whole package. This is, look like a bit complicated, but as I mentioned before, that it is influenced by the property, empowered by Purusha, produced by the gross body, driven by the desires. So now we go back this model. Prakriti. What is Prakriti? Prakriti has tremendously unifying force. It has, it has a strength to develop and grow our system, while the Purusha has the strength or the power to create. And now Purusha has four or five items that it works through, is buddhi, intellect. Intellect has two parts, buddhi has two parts, intellect and also consciousness. Aham, identity, manas is mind, chitta is consciousness. So these four or five factors works uh, with the, uh, the Purusha. Now, as I told you before, that is the, that karma is generated through the prakriti, reactions of the prakriti and purusha. Gross body produced it. Channeling through our senses. Who produced it? Or subtle body, mind. Produced by the gross body, but the compulsion from the subtle body. Because our mind has the desires, feelings. So that's why it is a, it, though it looks very complicated, but actually it is a very simple thing. It is a reaction from the Prakriti and Purusha produced by the gross body, channeling through our senses and the mind and the compulsion from the mind. That is our karma here. Now karma has different types and different kinds. I will discuss a little later, but that karma is accumulated in our system like causal body, soul accumulates it, and that is transferred from one life to another. So the next slide, so how karma generates, that is our conclusion I showed you before. And the second step is, that is accumulates in our cosmic account, and that is carried by the atma or soul, and that determines the next life. I already mentioned, now I am repeating here. This one I will discuss later if I have time. Now, so now I conclude my first part. That is how karma generates. Now I move to second part, the dimensions of karma. Karma has four or four dimensions. That is very important. Please, if you please do, please make a note that karma is a must. It means we as a human, we must have to do karma. Everybody does that karma according to Bhagavad Gita. Everybody has to do their uh, duties and it has certain results. And the second dimension is no results come without a cause, cause and effect. And the Third dimension is, it is a duty of life. And that is where I elaborate a little bit more. And the fourth dimension is karma never lost. And that determines next life. So karma is a must, it's certain results. It is produced as a cause and effect, and it is a duty of life, but that never perishes, never lost. So I discuss a little bit more detail here. First dimension, types of karma. Karma is a cycle. There are three types of karma in the accumulation uh, point of view. Prarabdha karma, a action that Gita is present but And the Kriya karma, that is we are doing in the present time. And Sanjita karma, karma, that is Kriya karma, and past and present, that will accumulate, give rise to future but So it is a cycle. So we need to break that cycle. That is our goal. So 
I may not go in detail here, it's just a cycle. Praraddha karma to Kriya karma and then Sanjita karma and then Agami karma. That will make a karma cycle. Now the first and second uh, uh, dimension is that according to Bhagavad Gita, that we must do our duties, that is cause, and then the face the consequences. That simple, we know it. According to Veda, Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita, we chose to be here based on past karma, that is memory that recorded. That is the transmigratory process, certain and unfailing. That is the punch line. That is the main takeaway message. Second dimension. We born in an interpreted world. Otherwise, it is unexplainable why there are differences among humans, why there are so many life forms. It is not a random phenomena. Every action has a cause. Nobody dumped us here without any purpose. That defy all kinds of logic. So in that sense, we are intergalactic time travelers. Because we do not know how many life we passed in the, in, uh, we passed and how many life we will travel in future. So we may be in this world only, or we may be coming out from the another galaxy or somewhere else, we do not know, nobody knows. So in that sense, we are older than dinosaurs, older than cosmos. So now we move to third dimension. Karma is actually more than cause and effect. And that is the one of the punch line here that karma has distinct two parts. One is the activity part and outcome part. That's why in our Bhagavad Gita, I am coming to that point, that sloka, saying that you have to do your duty, but you have no control of the outcome. So human has the ability, we have the opportunity and privilege to change the course of action it's based on three gunas. That's why Bhagavan Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita repeatedly mentioned that you have to rise above the mode of ignorance and mode of passion to mode of goodness. So that's why the karma we have to do, we have to rise above. So we have that ability to change and that we can create the destiny. And because we are a part of a larger effect, that is transmigration, because that will accumulate, I mentioned before. Now here, law of karma in Bhagavad Gita. I'll mention here few uh, shlokas and the meaning I'll just tell you. So let's go one by one. <laughs> You know the meaning. So what it means actually, we have a right to do the karma, but not its fruity part, because that is not our control. That is controlled and planned by the Lord probably, but we have the right to do the karma. And the next sloka, that is in chapter 3, number 5. What is said that everybody has to do karma, that is prescribed duties, but we have to free from attachment. Then the next in Ghana, uh, yoga, 17 and 18 sloka this one by mention here because that we have a two types of karma here we see 
one is influenced by mode of uh, ignorance and mode of uh, passion. That is B karma. It has consequences. This is bad karma. We say usually say. But then we have a good karma or that has no consequences. It means that no bad action. That is the mode of goodness. So it is saying that before birth, we promise to do sadhvik karma. However, after birth, our desires predominate and forget what has been promised. Thus, we contaminate our soul and face the consequences. Now, now where it is mentioned that our soul is contaminated, how? Actually, in Katha Upanishad and Mundaka Upanishad clearly mentioned that we, human, produce karma. If it is not a mode of goodness, then it is contaminate our soul and the soul become conditioned. What does it mean contaminate? It is not a contamination by quantitatively or qualitatively. It is a, like a like a some sort of dust or some sort of shit outside the uh, atma. So, so the, now I move to fourth dimension. Karma is recorded. So karma never lost. It accumulates in in the and accumulates in the atma. And that carried. So we are. We mentioned already that we are manusha, and we have buddhi, aham. It means identity, mind, and the soul, the memory. Where the memory, the all the karma is recorded in our cosmic account through soul. And as we are the light beams from the super light energy in the varanam um, varga. Uh, so. Mantra. Gayatri Mantra is saying that we are Barinang Bharga. It means that we the light being. That memory perpetuates through the life after life. Now, the fourth dimension, karma retains in our cosmic account. In the Vedic literature, karma cannot be, according to Vedic literature, karma cannot be destroyed. So we can interpret human life and other lives. We can define laws of nature, laws of physics, laws of conservation of energy. It is not a random phenomenon. Every action has a cause. I mentioned before. Thus, human life is dignified, have distinct identity, and thus purposeful. Because we have another level of existence linked to Paramatma. So, now, the activity part of karma is our own. So that is explained how the activity part of karma is our own, not the fruity part. Otherwise, transmigration process would be unexplainable. Now, the, the reason is, usually God is, Atma is a part of God. That actually should carry everything and should do everything. But actually, in Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 13, 32, and 33, clearly saying, soul does nothing, nor involved in, and exists as transcendental form. So, Atma is contaminated by the mundane karma and becomes conditioned. As I mentioned before, in Katha Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, and Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, shlok number 5. So, that is because of our own karma but not the fruity part. Now I move to fourth dimension. The other side of the coin is, if we do not consider all these things, then our life would be negligible, precariously endangered, purposelessly insignificant, and what a waste. Is it not an insult to human life? So that's why my point is here that human life is dignified, have distinct identity and thus purposeful. Okay, that is the two parts I mentioned. Now I go to conclusion. Karma is the outcome of 25 to 30 factors of human existence. While Lord has blessings to do duties, Vedic verdict, but 
we forget and act according to our feelings and desires. That's why we generate a lot of karma based on mode of ignorance and mode of passion. While part of karma is our own, that is our activity part, but most of the part is maybe planned and controlled by the Supreme Lord. Human has given the ability to generate karma. We have the enormous opportunity and privilege to change our destiny. But if we generate bad karma, we face the consequences. And the effects never destroy. And transmigration is inevitable of the karma. So therefore, we cannot die. As a soul, we are immortal and eternal and part of Brahman. So I found a one simple quote from a British physicist, Professor Paul Davis, in his famous book, The Mind of God. What he said, the universe is no minor byproduct of mindless, purposeless forces. We are truly meant to be here. How? That is because of karma. Because we chose to be here. By the means of science, we can truly see into the mind of God. And that actually concludes my presentation. But one thing I need to tell you that I will be requesting at the end of Q&A, uh, Dr. Sajal Palit to recite one Shanti Mantra. But not now, I'll request him at the end when after Q&A. Acknowledgement, Doc, I present a mock presentation in front of Sajal Palit, Sunil Dutta, and Animal Karmokar. They give a nice, Feedback, thank you. And I consulted two papers. One is a joint paper by Dr. Palto Datta and Jones about yoga, Karma Yoga, and another by Mr. Nityananda Chakravati, President of Gita Sangha Bangladesh. I consulted that paper, very nicely written. There is a nice uh, a review of the dimensions of karma, but the dimensions I presented here is based on all Bhagavad Gita. So thank you for listening. And that is the end of my presentation. Now the session is open for Q&A. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Saha. What a fascinating, what an interesting, very stimulating, most coherent and logically uh, organized presentation. Such a wonderful, you know, the profound, uh, the words, sequences, the way you have presented really, uh, I think anyone, even the layman will understand. Uh, I happen to believe that it's uh, quantum physics has nothing to do with karma, but you have reminded that it's not only the Buddhist idea that it is a physiological phenomenon, but uh, I'm just wondering how a great marriage between uh, social psychology, physiology, and the physics. It's a great marriage, and to our events every day, what is happening? Uh, uh, Dr. Shukanto, uh, well done. Really, really, it's a fascinating uh, presentation. It's just human body, the, from brain, from head to toe. It's well structured and uh, well presented, the most uh, vibrant way, and I have really enjoyed thoroughly. And uh, you know that- um, Thank you. How I can say, I, I always thought that uh, Albert Einstein is the father of uh, physics, while Madame Curie is the mother of physics, and Newton is the last magician of the modern physics. But I feel that the karma process is a grandfather of any types of physics and modern science. And yes. that's my instant realization. I know that there's a lot of people uh, here uh, from Nityananda Chakraborty to Shajal Parit, the Dr. Bal Mukon, uh, Pound Shetty from uh, Mumbai, from Canada, uh, uh, Professor Padma Koli uh, is there, and there's many, many questions will come. And uh, again, thank you for acknowledgement. I think my paper was the very basic, very basic uh, paper. Uh, but again, thank you that um, you have acknowledged. Now let us see the floor is open. I think so I just, uh, you know that I'm going to start with my one uh, simple question to you, then I'm sure that uh, I'm going to allow many people, including Shazal Palit, uh, Dr. Shazal Palit, uh, 
Dr. Balmuk on the Pond City. We have the Nitanon of Dr. Bhatti, plus many, many. Uh, I think it will be very most stimulating. Now, uh, when you know that uh, I felt that um, uh, according to the law of karma, uh, that uh, whatever thoughts or energy we put out, that we must get back, uh, like as whether it is a good or bad. And you have mentioned that. Uh, the my question is, um, what was my question? I just wrote it down. Um, can you tell me when most people talk about karma, uh, they are likely referring, you also mentioned, the cause and effect. Now, which specific law of karma do you think will help us to understand the dynamics in Eastern Europe, what is happening now? I'm sorry, and I felt that karma is not only a ancient philosophical dimensions, but I feel that karma is one of the best school of thought to explain all phenomenon. So which karma is school of thought you think can be applied to understand the dynamics of in Eastern Europe, what is happening now, please. Very contemporary issue, very nice question. Thank you, nice to answer. Uh, actually, this is, this type of karma is based on our aham, our identity, but is our ego. And that is actually based on our, karma is three gunatika. It means there is a, a raja, tamaguna, raja guna and sadvik guna, which is mode of ignorance, mode of passion, and mode of goodness. Now, this is actually is coming out from personal ego, and then it is based on, I think, it is based on mode of passion. It means that ego transpire to, to, to such a degree that it is actually now beyond control. So that's why that ego actually is crosses the line and get is such a human catastrophe. It is nobody is immune of that. Those who are the aggressor and those who are the victim is no, nobody is immune out of it. So I believe my short answer is it is actually mode of passion. So it means yeah. that it is the Raja Guna that is actually need to rise above that. So it is works in the, in the as a, because it is a desire, it is actually coming out the compulsion of the, from the desire. If we go back to the, uh, go back to my uh, uh, model, which is actually, if, if we see that model, that it is, the, it is the subtle body that our mind has a compulsion to satisfy our desire. Then our gross body is produced it, but because it is actually country to country conflict, so that is look like a Raja Guna, is a mode of passion, and that actually now beyond control. Is that answer your question, Dr. Doctor? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank